So Evie is, um, has been a content strategist here at Shopify for about three years. She started as an international uh, strategist in advertising, and she found that she really liked the user experience and she really rooted for the users. So her pivot into product came with Shopify. And so like super interesting journey and she's got some great uh, content for us. It's going to be, oh actually I have the wrong one. <laughs> it's gonna be fundamentals. <laughs> UX fundamentals, sorry. See, this is like, they told me to bring jokes, but the jokes is me. <laughs> so, <laughs> fundamentals of uh, pillars of UX, and it's going to be common uh, frameworks for designing UX, what does good UX look like, and some of their favorite tools for, um, for UX, I guess, right? So, I'll let it, her take it away, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I am not Nick Evans, as you might have seen in the pictures. We do have a similar haircut, though, but uh, that's kind of where it ends. Um, yeah, so welcome to Shopify, and thank you so much for coming along. Um, before I start, um, Nick really wanted to be here, but today, as she was practicing, she could barely like finish a sentence without like exploding in a cough attack. So, I'm like doing her presentation for her on behalf of Nick Evans. <laughs> Uh, but I'm also a product content strategist, uh, and I've been at, uh, like as Shahani mentioned, I've been here for three years. Um, I was the second person on the team in Montreal, Nick being the first one. She's currently the product content lead. Um, anyway, so today we're going to take a brief dive into UX uh, and look at a few key pillars and some examples. So we're going to take a high-level look at some of the fundamentals and themes of UX. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, or um, we're not even covering all the bases. Um, after all, we only have like 20-ish, 25 minutes. Um, but these are some of the key pieces that define UX, and they are the things that kind of crop, crop up in the day-to-day -day, uh, life of a UXer, such as myself. So before we dive into things, Let's get on the same page uh, when it comes to some key terms. Alban describes UX as all the aspects of how people use and interact, uh, use an interactive product, the way it feels in their hands, how well they understand how it works, how they feel about it while they're using it, how well it serves their purpose, and how well it fits into their entire context in which they are using it. And I really like this definition of UX. To me, this represents both the functional and the human-centered side of, of the practice. And all of these pieces that come together and shape an experience. And that brings us nicely onto our definition of UX design. So, user experience design is the process design teams use to create products that provide meaningful and relevant experiences to users. We'll dive into the meaningful and relevant bits a bit later, but essentially UX design is a human first way of designing products. UX design is not about visuals. It focuses on the overall feel of the experience and how easy it is for users to accomplish their task. It's also good, uh, it's also good to emphasize um, that anyone who shares this mission is a UXer. These teams are ideally composed of a UX designer, content strategist, researcher, front-end development even, data scientist, like the list goes on. And another important term, user interface. UI complements UX. It is the look, feel, presentation, and interactivity of digital products. It is the means by which a human and a system interact. And it seems more complex than it is maybe, but it's best to show you an example. So it's basically the application slash software on our mobile phones, devices. Through the UI, we're able to open an app, make a call, schedule an appointment, make a purchase. It's endless, as you all know. And interface elements include buttons, text, checkboxes, radio buttons, toggles, etc. And I find that this quote sums up UX overall and its related pieces quite well. UX applies to anything that can be experienced, be it a website, a coffee machine, or a visit to the supermarket. 
The user experience part refers to the interaction between the user and the product or service. User experience design then considers all the different elements that shape this experience. And for this talk, we'll explore UX through a product design lens as we're at Shopify, and that's kind of how we do it here. Before we dive into some of the UX pillars, let's look at what makes a good user experience at a high level. Now this is Peter Morville's um, UX honeycomb. These are the core attributes he believes a well-rounded user experience should possess. It also centers around a few of the questions user asks themselves about an experience. Can I use this product, site, or tool? Can I find the information that I need? Can I trust what I'm seeing? And is this meant for me? And these aren't just necessary UX attributes. They're also the things that we as UX teams can measure and test. They're as important to us UXers as they are to the user. And these questions make sure that meaning and relevance are top of mind at all the time and gives us a way to assess success in UX. That's a funny sentence. <laughs> um, keep this in mind as we work through some of our examples. So let's dive in. Pillar number one, understanding the user needs and motivations. Why is this our first key pillar? Well, if we don't know anything about our users, how will we know what problem we need to solve? And this is one of my favorite parts uh, of the UX process, actually. And as a content strategist, it's the thing that I rely on the most to form my rationale and do the work that I need to do. This is an important early stage. At Shopify, we call this the think stage. Uh, before we can define or explore, we need to spend some time in our users' shoes and minds and deeply understand what the problem is that we're trying to solve. It is effectively about this, um, having a deep understanding of users, what they need, what, what they value, their abilities, and also their limitations. Piercing together a complete picture of our users, which in turn helps us focus on the problems we need, want, and could solve. And there is a few different ways we can do this. Not everyone has access to a wealth of users, for example. But digging into insight doesn't need to depend on that. You can start with your own team, industry, and market research and knowledge. There are a couple of tools that I love to do uh, this type of work. This is a user need statement, also known as a problem statement or point of view statement. Um, these are the primary tools in early stages of design thinking. They align different points of view before moving forward. These can be generated on market studies, uh, first-hand user research, uh, or group assumptions and predictions. This is one structure you could use to create them. And it's a way to find themes in the needs you outline and align as a whole team on the most impactful thing uh, sorry, on the most impactful problem that you need to solve for the user. Another great way to understand users is to understand our own assumptions and biases. Julie Booth, who used to be a UX researcher here at Shopify, uh, talks about this in her blog called uh, The Assumption Slams, uh, which you can actually find on the Shopify UX Medium blog. Uh, an Assumption Slam is a group activity where a team writes down all their assumptions and assesses them based on possible risk and evidence. Julie talks about the need for answers to these questions. Number one, find out if there was evidence to back these beliefs. And number two, decide if it was risky to move on unvalidated beliefs before solving and diving into a solution. So both assumption slams and user need statements are low cost, low effort, and they're great ways to build a bigger picture of your users. And this insight can really help anchor and guide the next steps of the UX design process. On to pillar two, usability. So usability refers to how easy a user interacts with a website or a product or a tool. 
Usability is composed of loads of pillars, principles, and practices, but today we'll only touch three. Uh, learnability, hierarchy, and readability. So regardless of which element of usability we explore, this goal is consistent. No amount of swish animations or benefit-filled content can make up for the lack of function and usability. Good design is ultimately determined by usability. Digital design inherits a lot of its behaviors from things we use in our analog life, like buttons and sliders. This means people come to expect things to behave a certain way, even if they aren't the same physical or technical constraints. It's because of this that a huge factor in learnability is predictability. Making an experience feel as intuitive and familiar as possible is the goal. And one of the best ways to create a familiar experience uh, help users learn and be efficient is to create and use consistent UX patterns and elements. Take Google for example. In many of their products, it's pretty, uh, pretty easy to use their core functions. However, if you dig a little deeper, uh, there's always more advanced functionality hidden away. But once you find it, you can find it over and over again. If we look at Google Maps, finding a location on a map or planning a route is very easy to most of us. However, there are lots of other features that can be turned on if you know where to look. And if you wanted to see photos of the locations, then it's possible to find this without being intrusive or distracting. By using common elements or components in your UI, users settle into the experience more easily and are more effective in getting things done. Here, in the slide, cards are used to group similar concepts and tasks together to make Shopify easier for users to scan, read, and get things done. At Shopify, we use Polaris, which is our design system, as our guide. And each component serves a purpose and is used consistently throughout the whole product. Managing expectations and helping to create comfort in consistency is a big part of UX design. It is important to create patterns in language, behavior, and design. And users should be able to transfer a learned skill to other parts of the product or website. And this also applies to color. In fact, this is probably one of the most effective ways to help users learn and self-identify. It's a system that they can learn once and then they can just recall it. Green means success, yellow is critical, red is a warning. All require different levels of action and effect. Once learned though, they can be helpful cues that users can carry with them into the product and into the experience. And that is a nice segue into hierarchy. Hierarchy helps to create focal points, gives the user an entry point to start consuming designs and guides them to the most important information. And when I say hierarchy, uh, I mean specifically visual hierarchy, how a page or experience is structured and presented to reflect the importance of information. And this is one of the most common UX problems that I and other content strategists face. How to design a page so it's easy for users to find what they need. And there's a different bunch of approaches and techniques out there. Um, there's the Z pattern hierarchy and the F hierarchy that are commonly used on web pages, for example, to aid scannability. But when designing a visual hierarchy, starting from all the possible pieces and defining the importance of information should actually be your first stop and step of the process. And to do this, uh, you can use something called content modeling, uh, which is quite a familiar tool a lot of content strategists do. I map out all the pieces that will make up my page or experience, things like tasks, actions, buttons, pieces of information and content, anything that will need to be part of the UI. And this activity uncovers relationships between pieces of content. And the page design starts to actually come to life from this point. Using a tool like Whimsical, uh, which is great, can help my, uh, map out the connections, the related actions, and any dead ends that you might have. And from here, you get a bit of a clear idea of what needs to be the primary information and what matters the most to the user. 
I can refer to my user need statements or the results of my assumption slam that I mentioned earlier to help guide me in this prioritization process. Now once we have a good idea of the content pieces and the relationships, we can get down to exploring what these looks like on a page uh, or as part of a flow. Using our consistent patterns and elements we mentioned earlier, we can start looking at an overall design. Low fidelity sketching on a whiteboard or a pad is best for this type of work, but there are other tools that you can use like Figma or Sketch. Uh, but working in low fidelity makes collaboration a lot easier. From here, you basically just iterate and iterate and iterate until your confidence grows in your solution. A next step for this kind of work is to focus on the content that will be on the future feature. This leads us nicely to our third usability pillar, which is readability. Readability measures the complexity of a word and sentence structure in a piece of content. There's lots of things that contribute to the readability of content. Use of passive voice, tone, uh, page design, use of labels, titles, um, even how plain language is used or if it's jargon free. But there is one thing that really is relevant to the work we do, uh, and it's to make the UI as compre comprehensive as possible. Um, and you can do that through reading levels. Writing uh, using plain language doesn't mean dumbing content down. It's about making sure language is straightforward and communicates concepts as efficiently as possible. As a benchmark, we consider plain language to be a United States grade seven reading level, and that's here at Shopify. And this is one of the favorite tools of mine, actually. Um, it's an app called Hemingway. There are actually lots of apps that are like this, but this is my personal favorite. Uh, and it helps you ID the readability level of your content while also providing suggestions on how to improve it. Now let's see an example of how this actually works. So I popped the blurb from Polaris into Hemingway and uh, we got a grade 10, which is not perfect, but it's, it's okay. Um, and seeing as we're aiming for grade seven, I used Hemingway to see like, how can we make this better? And we got it down to a grade six. So readable content isn't just the result of one thing, um, but understanding the difference that makes this, uh, the difference that this makes, makes it very valuable to a user. And a tool like Hemingway is a key tool in UX design. And now finally, we have reached our final pillar, which is delight. And I'm sure that's something I'm sh like most of you have had uh, experience with or witnessed it in any apps or online experience that you've had. Satisfaction plays a huge role in something being and feeling usable. Making an experience delightful and joyous is more than just injecting some playful language or animations. And this is a noble goal, but it's also filled with pitfalls. That delight doesn't work for delight's sake. It should enhance the experience and ideally be purposeful. There's a few types of delight that resonate well with users. Things like celebration, personalization, um, and personality being a few. And celebration is a really valid and valuable uh, form of delight in products. It's great to mark success and building confidence in your user. Shopify used this as a way to connect with users and letting them know that what they've achieved should be celebrated. Slack, for example, uses their unique playful tone in things like error messages, pairing function with personality nicely. And this message becomes memorable and that affects how efficient a user can be when using a product. Animation also plays a huge role in delight and simple touches can reassure and confirm actions without the need of a notification. There is delight and expectation and knowing what will come next. 
Empty or zero states are a great way of setting expectations while taking advantage of a chance to show some personality. We don't often get the space to do that in the UI. Dropbox is a great example of this. They never sacrifice UX for delight. Instead, they use their illustrations and tone to round out specific experiences. And Instagram uses a nudge animation to encourage action and connection. It's not imposing, and it's easy to ignore. So, with great delight comes great responsibility. Anchor delight in meaning and relevance. Users are smart. They'll see through attempts to dazzle, to try to dazzle or distract them. So before I jump into some information about Shopify, uh, let's just recap some of these questions. Regardless of the pillar, principle, or discipline, these are the questions that anchor UX work. Relevance and meaning make products and experiences usable. Patterns and expectations make an experience efficient. And delight helps create moments of joy and satisfaction that keep users coming back. Right, so a little bit about Shopify. We're a multidisciplinary team and diverse UX team of over 400 people. Uh, we're made up mostly of product designers, researchers, UX developers, uh, communication designers, but it's also the home of some in industrial designers, uh, taxonomists, accessibility experts. It's a, it's a wide range of people. Uh, we build products that help people start, manage, and scale their businesses. And uh, our headquarters is in Ottawa, um, and we have some offices in Toronto, Waterloo, um, here in Montreal, obviously, uh, and smaller offices in Vancouver, New York, San Francisco, uh, Berlin, Singapore. Yeah, we're basically taking over the world. Um, and Shopify has worked hard to build a culture that supports the people that work here. So one that allows you to do your best work, basically. And when solving problems, there is a lot of anatomy that allows us to solve them and with all the UX disciplines contributing right from the start of a project. Development-wise, we're also given the space and time to work on our craft so that we can contribute, uh, sorry, not contribute, well, I guess, yeah, but continue uh, to learn new skills and keep contributing to our teams. Uh, and there's the opportunity to connect with our users and the people that use our products, meaning we get to learn from entrepreneurs and merchants. So if you want to stay connected with us, there's a few ways to do this. There are blog posts on the UX Shopify Medium blog, which is great. We keep that really updated. Uh, and then there's a newsletter from Shopify UX every two weeks. Thank you so much. Um, shout out to Nick, who couldn't be here. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we're doing questions at the end. And uh, I'll post my slides if anyone's interested to have a look at them later. Thank you so much. Yeah.